At this moment, I'm going to ask the candidates to give a one minute personal opening statement. Please tell us who you are, where you're from, and any information you can give our audience on a more personal level. In chronological order today, vying for District 9 seat, we have with us Richard Castagnon, he's not here. So we're gonna go with Jeffrey Vance Leike. Good morning, I am honored to be here today. Thank you to the Chamber and to Telemundo. Uh, it, the, the opportunity to share a message is, is imperative. Uh, in eighth grade, I found an opportunity, I'm the youngest of six, to scrape trays during lunch because uh, we just didn't have any money and that's the way I got my lunch. All the other kids went out and played while I scraped uh, the trays at lunch in exchange for lunch. I don't know if, I guess at that point, I just, just perceive that as a, a, a process of being a servant rather than being uh, uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a retired police officer from San Antonio. I've trained police all over the world, uh, Kosovo, Iraq, Russia, Germany, and, and uh, currently I'm teaching over, in Santa, over at Judson High School. Uh, teaching kids that, that struggle with the STAR test. And I look forward to visiting with everybody today. Mr. Joel Cryer, please. A personal statement. Opening Thank statement. you. I'm Joel Cryer. <clears throat> I have lived in San Antonio for more than 40 years and in District 9 for more than 30 years. I had the privilege for 20 of those years of being president and CEO of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce and spent a great deal of time during those years involved in all of the major efforts that brought jobs to our community and helped build our infrastructure like the AT&T Center and the Alamo Dome as well as numerous streets and drainage and libraries and bond projects in our community. Those are the kinds of things that build a better community. I've had the privilege of serving on city council for a year and a half and during that time have led the effort to see that citizens got to vote on the streetcar project and ensured that we got a back to basics budget with no tax increase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cryer. Now, Mr. Thomas Seconi, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Correctly, yes. Seconi. I get it a lot of ways. <laughs> I spend a tour in Alabama. <clears throat> I'm Bert Seconi, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, which makes me a Steeler fan. Not now, but then. Uh, cowboy fan now. And uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh Dental School, graduate school through the Air Force at the University of Michigan, have an interest in research and education and sports. Uh, enjoy playing golf, uh, although I take too many strokes, even when I cheat. <laughs> and uh, I, I enjoy Politics is a hobby, and I don't know if I would like it as a, a contact sport. And it's always a pleasure to be with Joe and Jeffrey and Mike. Mike and I are ex-Air Force officers, uh, but he was with the chief of staff, and I was fixing the teeth of those that were fighting for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want you all to know that the last candidate in this district, Loris Lusher, previously committed to this event, but now she has a, com a conflict and is unable to participate. So we have with us District 10 uh, incumbent and current councilman, Mike Gallagher. Good morning, Mr. Gallagher. Good morning. And again, like the other candidates here, I just want to thank everybody for enduring having to listen to all these politicians over the last few weeks. We really do appreciate your efforts. Uh, I come from a military background, almost 29 years in the United States Air Force. I served in uh, public affairs capacity. So ironically, what I did in the Air Force is almost exactly what I'm doing here on council, giving speeches, turning out newsletters, and oh yes, talking to the press. So we do that all the time. But I've been involved uh, really in neighborhood work more than anything else. We organized the Northeast Neighborhood Alliance. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, that's 85 neighborhoods that get together now. And so when we get up in front of them and talk about what's going on with city issues, it's amazing how many voters we get to communicate because of that, how many people that are interested in civic activities. So as far as I'm concerned, this was a great way for us to be involved and hear the voice of the people in the district. Thank you. 
On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, I want to tell you that we are very glad that you join us, even though the, your opponent, Ms. <coughs> Celeste Montestir, will decline our invitation. So let the forum begin. These are the questions for the candidates. I, we will decide them. Questions will take about 30 seconds. Each question will be limited to one topic and addressed to one candidate at a time. Candidates may or may not be asked the same question by the moderator. Answers will be 90 seconds. Green, yellow, and red light to assist in timing on teleprompter. At the end of the forum, each candidate will have two minutes for closing arguments. So don't feel that you have, you will have two minutes to say whatever you want to say. So let's start. Um, the first question will be addressed to Mr. Secconi. And it will be, San Antonio is committed to investing a significant amount of money into funding the 142-mile Vista Ridge water pipeline with the intention of expanding our water supply and securing additional water supplies for the city. As a city council member, do you support this project or do you have other projects to increase our water capacity? Uh, <clears throat> pertaining to water, uh, I rely on experts and, and, and their ex uh, expertise in hydraulics and I take their word for it. As a uh, political activist, I know that water is our most precious asset. And anything that would ensure future water supplies, I would be in favor of. I'm in favor of that project. I don't know the details of it, but I certainly like the end results, which gets us about 50,000 acre feet a year, which in ensures our, our water supply well into the future. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Slyke. Same question? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I will be voting for it, for the, the uh, Vista Ridge project. Uh, I think that we can do additional things. When I say we, we as a community, as individuals, and collectively. Uh, if you haven't been near a school when it rains, the volumes and volumes of water running off the roofs. If we can develop more rainwater catchments, two things are going to happen. We're going to capture water uh, that can be used. Uh, uh, and we're going to provide some relief to, to the wastewater system, too. Um, and back to the Vista Ridge, uh, I think it, it, it does offer a solution, and we can breathe. Um, but I have some concerns with the transparency of it. And I think that, that uh, uh, and I don't say that casting any stones at anything. I just think that if we open up and, and we can see more information, we as a community then can activate and get more persons involved. And that's what we need to do uh, with, with the Vista Ridge is, is share more information. Who's going to be doing it? How is it going to be done? And, and, and let's, let's bring more of the community involved, share the opportunities, and, and uh, that will also address giving some, some employment opportunities. Uh, just we've, we've got to get more people involved. For Vista Ridge, uh, uh, I'll be voting for it. I think that uh, it does provide uh, a sense of relief for the days ahead. Mr. Cryer, related to the same topic, do you support the current financial commitment and corresponding rate increase this project has on taxpayers? Sure. A a the answer to that is, is yes, uh, water is not free. It's going to be an increasingly expensive commodity. In this century, many people realize that in this century, water will have the economic importance that oil and gas had in the last century. And that's why I spent uh, literally two and a half months meeting with a group of people every week to work on city council to get the Vista Ridge project passed, which we passed unanimously. We knew when we passed it that it would require a series of rate increases over time. Even as those rate increases are adopted, San Antonio will still have one of the lowest overall water rates per capita of any big city in Texas and of any big city in the United States. The good news, though, is that during the 20 years I was at the chamber, we lost a lot of employers who were considering moving to San Antonio and decided not to because we did not own our water future. We had great plans, but we had no ownership. And now, for the first time, we own a 30-year supply of water. Uh, importantly, we will get more water at the front end than we need, which is one of the reasons why I initiated some meetings with the military community here 
to provide them with water uh, so that they can get off of their current stage four water restrictions. Thank you, Mr. Cryer. Mr. Gallagher? Yes, I think like everyone here this morning, uh, this Vista Ridge project is one of the most important items that uh, Joe and I had the opportunity to vote on uh, this past year. It's absolutely essential for the future of our area. Uh, believe it or not, one of the things uh, just mentioned that we've got to be concerned about is uh, what the aquifer level is right now. Uh, as the Base Realignment and Closure Commission will be eventually visiting us here in the next couple of years, they'll be looking at the resources that are available for these military installations. We could be in big trouble if we continue to dry up. And what's really been upsetting is to watch that Edwards Aquifer level drop and drop <coughs> and drop. And fortunately, uh, this rain that we've had in the last little while has brought it up a couple of feet, but nowhere near where it needs to be. We have to have these other opportunities for water and so I'm very pleased that this project's underway but I also do like the uh, unique ideas of coming up with other ways of preserving it so I hope that we do that as well thank you, thank you. on to me uh, the next question uh, Bert, would be to you please the city's public safety functions police fire and EMS are supported by the city's general fund these funds also support other key functions, such as libraries, parks, street repairs, and code enforcement. Alone, the public safety departments constitutes the largest general fund expenditures in the city's budget, which has resulted in fewer funds being available to other city needs. Do you support the city's negotiations to reduce fire, police and fire department benefits that would limit these expenditures to no more than 66% of the city's budgets. And if you're not in support of the current city's approach, which services would you recommend reducing or increasing taxes? Uh, tough question. Uh, not an easy answer. I I'm inclined to think that we have to be very careful with public safety. Uh, if, if we don't have public safety in order, I'm afraid that all those other things that you mentioned won't be functioning very well, as, as we see is ha unfortunately happening in, in some of our cities. Presently, you know what I'm, which city I'm speaking about. And uh, to, to pick out how much money should go to which department uh, is, is a, a very shaky thing, especially when you start talking about what, what base, which figures are you, are you speaking about, and can those figures ever be moved around? I would be inclined to see where we can get additional funds. For example, we, we uh, it, 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 I think it's amendment number one, or proposition number one, uh, voting on, on preserving the, the, uh, the water supply, our, our, uh, our uh, aquifer, which is, which is important and which we should do. But what I find very interesting is that that, that aquifer goes over six counties, and, and everybody uses the Edwards Aquifer, and it's, uh, uh, the recharge is roughly 613 acre feet a year. The city has an allocation of about 270 to 300,000 300, acre feet a year, which basically means that the city of San Antonio gets 50% of the water and it pays 100% of the protection. Why don't these other counties chip in, pay their, they pay their 50% and that will give us a 50%, that's millions of dollars, which we could apply to other needs such as public safety and infrastructure. Great, thank you very much. Jeffrey, same question to you, please. Could I get uh, a real quick overview of the question one more time, please? The city's public safety functions, police, fire, and EMS, support the city's general fund, are supported by the city's general fund, and it represents a rather significant <coughs> portion. The city is in the process of negotiating with police and fire. The approach being taken is to reduce some of the health care benefits that police and fire enjoy today that are different than most of all of us that uh, work um, um, outside of uh, the public sector. Are you in favor of that? Are you in favor of the negotiations in reducing the health care benefits of police and fire? And if not, what uh, services would you address, reduce, or taxes would you increase to offset the continued increase 
that these services or these costs represent of the city's general fund budget? Okay. Uh, first off, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, a, a true statement. I Honestly, I'm not sure that the city is negotiating with police and fire at this point. Uh, it has been interrupted with a lawsuit, and, and uh, until we can get that out of the way, where both sides can come together and work in a spirit of negotiating, uh, you take the resources, you look at the objective and the mission of the police department and fire set department and, and public safety, and you bring the two together. And together, uh, the associations and the city uh, look at what, what we're objectives are, what resources we have, and you bring it together, whether it is for uh, the medical, whether it is for whatever ever other uh, uh, needs there are. So if we can get that lawsuit out of the way, they can come together and, and work. Now back to the 66%, uh, even that is a fluid number uh, of late, uh, and that's fair enough. Uh, city management, you, 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 you shift programs, and uh, that's not unfair. But to make that as a stipulation, what 66% was two years ago, last year, and this year, is, is, too, is too dynamic to lock in on that. Uh, yes, we need to come together. Uh, we're in there. The police and, uh, uh, have, have said, yeah, let's come together. Let's look at what. It's a matter of give and take. In years past, in years past, the police have sacrificed other benefits in exchange for that insurance. I think they need to come to the table and, and address the issue. Th thank you. Joe, same question. And just to um, elaborate a little bit, being the chairman of the Economic Development Council the last two years, we spent time validating those numbers. So the 66% is a real number, and it is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison over historical data that proves that police and fires expenditures are absorbing much, much more of the city's budget. So how would, are you in support of the city's approach? And again, if not, what taxes would you increase and or services would you reduce? Well, th number one, thank you for the question. I do support the approach the city has taken on this. Uh, we know that the current costs in this year's budget, because we do not have a union agreement, will be in excess of 66 percent, somewhere between 67 and 68 percent. We have got to bring those costs under control, or they will eat up the funds that are currently available for streets and, streets and drainage, libraries, and parks. And that's not healthy. I do not support raising property taxes either in the last budget or in the, in the, in the budget coming up. We have had a series, series of good negotiations with the police union. The fire union is yet to come to the table. Uh, I think we are close to reaching an agreement. My prediction is we will reach one shortly after the election, frankly. And the good news is that the city's position uh, in its last offer has been to offer a substantial pay raise and uh, a reduction in health care benefits that would require a contribution for spouse and dependents. Uh, the better news is that when the police union came back to the table, they agreed for the first time that their dependents should make some contribution for that cost while the city continues to provide full coverage for the uniformed officer. 66% is a good number. We ought to find out a way to stick to it and not increase property taxes. Thank you, Joe, for your answer. Uh, Mike, I just want to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, we see across the country cities like Detroit, Chicago, Stockton, California, that have these same issues. The city enjoys a AAA rating through the investment community today. Uh, are you, do you have any concern about the potential of losing that AAA rating, which would have a significant financial impact on the community and uh, the city? And what are your thoughts on this issue, please? No, I think that you raise a very important concern that uh, we all need to be looking at. One thing we have to step back, though, and look at this overall. Everybody here is really a victim of the problem of rising health care costs. They all are. I mean, that's what worked uh, many years ago when that uh, the contract was uh, signed. 
does not work today. We have to take that into consideration, and that's what that lawsuit's all about. It's not against people. It's against this evergreen clause. If it were to continue, we would go to 2024 with the same contract. We could end up in a situation very similar to what happened to Detroit. That could bust the city's budget. So, yes, I feel for the fire and I feel for the police, but we've got to come to some kind of consensus. What I would like to do now, and this is a little bit out of line, and that is to criticize the media coverage of this, uh, what's been going on here, because they've made it almost a personality issue, and that's not what's going on here. It's a numbers issue, and I've been very proud of the police and the city, how they've been getting closer and closer together, and I think that this is something that can be resolved, and I do hope that uh, FIRE will step up and say, yep, this is a good solution solution to this problem and let's get it done. But it is going to require that everybody's going to have to pay a little bit more in order to make this happen. Thank you. Mr. Gallagher, I'll make sure I'll put that in my package today <laughs> from 430 to 530. You watch it in Telemundo. The next question is very simple. Is that yes? I will. I promise. The next question is very simple. It's basically a yes or no answer and you can elaborate as to why you agree or not. Do you support spending taxpayer dollars to promote the recruitment and relocation of a professional football and or soccer team? Mr. Sacconi, please. Uh, I like football and I like soccer, but I, I question public funds to recruit them. I, I don't I don't know of, uh, of uh, I've gone to many movies and theaters, and I don't recall any actors asking me to pitch in to, to build their theater. And uh, I, I like their salaries are good, and I hope they make a lot of money, but I don't think that the taxpayers should fund their, their stadiums. I don't think we should pay to recruit them. We should make our city a city where people want to come and live and, and bring up their families and I could assure you that football teams and baseball teams and so on would want to participate in our city. Uh, they need us more than we need them. And how many watched the Spur games last night? From beginning to end. I, wa I was working. I was working, that's why I couldn't And it's hard it. for me to stay awake because I'm <laughs> over 29. <laughs> but no, I, I would not expend, to answer your question briefly, I would not use tax money to recruit any professional sport. Period. Thank you for your honesty, Mr. Slyke. Uh, I, I want to back up and, and look at uh, tax money. Out of, out of the general tax budget, no. We do have the hotel motel tax, the tourists uh, uh, designed to, to uh, bring tourism to San Antonio, which would include the sports. So out of the general fund budget and what, what you and I pay on our uh, home uh, uh, residential tax, and any of the sales tax, uh, that needs to go to the budget, take care of the streets and the libraries and the police and fire public safety. Uh, we don't need to be spending that money uh, trying to recruit a football team. Uh, I, it, it, uh, it, that doesn't make sense. But we do have uh, that special fund downtown to uh, the hotel, motel, and the rental cars. Uh, that money uh, should be designed if, if there's a legitimate effort and hope, and, and it can be validated that, that, you know, we might be able to bring someone to town. We can use that money uh, for, for recruiting. Uh, yes. Okay, Mr. Cryer. <coughs> Thank you. We have used in the past um, hotel, motel, and car rental taxes uh, to support uh, particularly the Spurs. The AT&T Center would not have been built without it. We had a voter approved sales tax which built the Alamo Dome. So we have set the precedent in this community of saying that major league sports are an asset that big cities have and particularly that the young professionals we want to move here and stay here expect to find when they live in a city. We've had ongoing discussions about a soccer field acquisition of the existing soccer stadium. Uh, it happens to be in Councilman Gallagher's district, he has really played a leadership role in uh, recruiting a team and leading the charge for an effort that would bring us a professional soccer team. At this point, we do not have a deal on the table. So 
it's, it's uh, not possible for any of us to say I would support that deal because we don't have a deal to take either to the community or to city council. And uh, when that happens, uh, I'm willing to take a look at it and see what's best for the community, recognizing that professional sports have been an asset to big cities around the country. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much for this question because this is something that uh, I've really uh, supported. Major League Soccer could really help our city. You think about the jobs that can come, the development that can come, the new hotels and motels that will be built. This is a great opportunity for us and we right now have a facility that's not going to require the huge investment that other cities would have in order to make this happen. Out at beautiful Morgan's Wonderland we have a Toyota Field and it's actually been designed so that we can increase the size of it from 8,000 feet that it current uh, 8,000 seats that it currently has to 18,000 seats, which is exactly what MLS wants in order to uh, have a major league team here in San Antonio. You think about where we're located, right in the southern central part of this nation. Think about all the people from Latin America that will want to come up and see these games. This is something that will be a huge economic boon for the city of San Antonio. I think we need to pay close attention to it and I agree with uh, my colleagues here that it is something that we've got to make sure and do it right, do it smart, but I think it's something that will benefit all of us and I want everybody to get on board on this one. Thank you. So many good questions and obviously some good answers as well. And as I look through the list, it's really difficult for me to pick, but um, for the chamber, one of the key uh, priorities for the chamber, uh, and Bert, this question is for you, sir, first, uh, is related to transportation. Traffic congestion continues to be a critical issue for our economy, and there are multiple solutions needed to address it. Do you support the use of managed toll lanes as one of these transportation solutions for our traffic congestion? Uh, if we have toll lanes, the answer, to, my answer is no to that question briefly and to the point. But if we have toll lanes, uh, I want to know who built them and, and who benefits from them and, and, and then demonstrate how it would improve traffic flow. And if, if that was proven to be a positive, then I would change my view. But th that hasn't been proven to me yet. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure it would solve a problem. Certainly by itself, it wouldn't solve a problem. Uh, the more roads you build, the more cars that you make. I spend uh, a tour in Southern California, and half of that state is super highway, and they have terrible traffic. So it's obvious, obviously not a, not a solution by itself. And I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I, I have a few seconds. I want to ask a question. Being, we're I, I have, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, and I love sports, and I. I have a background in sports, but that's neither here nor there. I, I want to ask a question. What did the Baltimore Ravens do to help the situation that Baltimore is in today? Uh, I, I think there are other things more important than sports. I, I think I would rather pay teachers more money and respect th their profession. Uh, I, I think we need to do all we, can, all we possibly can to get an education for all of, give our, all of our students the opportunity to have an education. And I would, I would put those things ahead of toll roads, and I would put those things ahead of sports teams. And, and I, I, I like and enjoy sports. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your, your comments. Jeffrey, same question to you, sir. Uh, my, my short and quick answer is no, I will not support uh, toll roads. Now, when I say that, that is me. As the voice of District 9, if we can get a legitimate consensus and let District 9, I say District 9, let the city uh, vote on toll roads, whatever the city has, if, if the city says, you know what, we'll become a part of this, this uh, and let it happen. Uh, if District 9 were to overwhelmingly, the majority uh, convince me that they wanted toll roads, on behalf of District 9, I'd have to raise my hand. Myself, uh, I think we need to make sure that the voters would understand what's involved. Uh, when you build toll roads, there is such a, a phenomenal increase in the cost of construction that, that it just throws it into a new arena. Uh, pending on, as, as uh, Mr. Sacconi had said, pending on 
on uh, how it's funded, if we have international funding and such. Um, sometimes there is a, uh, uh, I've read about um, a no-compete clause to protect that investment, and that's not unreasonable, but do we want to prevent ourselves from developing additional lanes that are available for free? And no-compete clauses when the, the rates of tolls can increase, uh, that's, uh, that's scary. And so uh, I think we can build our infrastructure without adding toll lanes. <coughs> Great. Thank you very much for your answer. I really appreciate it. Joe, and, and I want to kind of add, add on to that. Um, uh, if, if you're not for tolls, and I'm just talking about roads right now, you know, what are some of your options, alternatives? Uh, because if, if you have to have a solution, there's got to be a solution to this. So what are, what are some of your uh, options? Well, look, here, here's the reality. San Antonio is going to have a million more people between the 2010 census and the 2040 census. Those million people are going to get to work, I predict, mostly in cars. And they're going to get to church and school and shopping mostly in cars. And that means we've got to provide roads for them to drive on. I've gone to Austin for more than 20 years to urge the state to quit diverting highway t gas tax money to other purposes. This year, for the first time, they're getting serious about doing that. But the truth of the matter is the state has been broke. We can't fund the kind of highway expansion we need with state money. Even with all the proposals in this legislature, as you know, Joe, there's still not going to be enough money to get back to the kind of robust highway construction that we enjoyed in the uh, first half of the last century when we built one of the best highway systems in the country. So my view has been if the state's not going to fund highways the traditional way, we've got to come up with creative alternatives. Toll roads have been one way to do that, and my position has been that I'm fine with toll roads as long as, uh, number one, we're not tolling existing roads, number two, there is a free alternative, and number three, there's no financial risk to the state. And thus far, all of the projects that have been built in Dallas and Houston and Austin meet that test. Uh, they have been financed and paid for uh, in large part by outside uh, risk capital. Uh, there has been a free alternative and we have not told existing roads. If we can continue to do that, then they fill a gap that no one else is filling. Great, thank you for your response. Michael, same question to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my answer is absolutely not. I do not support toll roads in any way whatsoever. Uh, interestingly, when this argument uh, came about, one of the new uh, words that we use are managed lanes to describe things. I think you can have managed lanes without having toll roads. They don't have to be the uh, the same definition. By managed lanes, I think we should encourage carpooling. I think we should encourage where the via buses drive and so forth. Design the roads. Use a little bit of imagination. Design those roads so that uh, they can be more efficiently used. Do we need to d divert uh, through truck traffic around the city instead of driving it through the center? For those of you who've been on I-35, you know sometimes it becomes a parking lot. If you're up in Austin, it is a parking lot. Why don't we have some clever ways of thinking about how we can manage this? I think that's absolutely essential to our future that we do so. And I do think it's extremely important that we talk about the diversion of highway funds. I think a big mistake has been made in this state where that money that should have gone to the repair of our infrastructure has been diverted to other sources. That is wrong, and I wish this legislature would step up and get this cleaned up right now. Thank you. Thank you. The following question is, one city charter proposal for San Antonio voters to decide in May is whether city council members should be paid for the services they provide. Do you support pay for our city council members? And if you do so, do you think that will change the dynamic of who we run for the city council in the future? Mr. Sacconi? I don't know who made this batting lineup, but I think I'm the leadoff batter. <laughs> uh, I can answer it. It's a pleasure to answer that question. And I, I am in favor of, of council pay, and I'm going to tell you why. In 1951, we adopted the present charter. 
And at that time, there were 400,000 citizens, and we occupied an area of 100, excuse me, 100 square miles. They elected 10 council members at large at that time, and then from the council members, they, they chose who would be mayor. They met once a week for two or three hours. They were part-time. That was in 1951. And I know that's a fact because I eat with the gentleman, he's a very good friend of mine, twice a month, <clears throat> and he sat on those councils. In San Antonio today, we have a population of well over one and a half million people. We occupy an area, a vast area of 465 square miles, which is probably about the size of New, of New York City. And we still elect 10 council members, but they are at a, they're from a district. They have a constituency and the mayor is elected at, at, at large. It is no longer a part-time job, it is a full-time commitment. In my district, uh, for example, <coughs> if each citizen in District 9 would contribute 25 cents to, to, to the salary of an of a elected official, they would earn $47,500 for the year. Uh, that is a great investment in democracy, and for that reason, I am for amendment number two, pay our council members. I'd pay Joe at least 30 cents a month. <laughs> it went down from 31, Joe. And uh, uh, they, they deserve our support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Slyke, please. Uh, absolutely, I do believe that our council members and uh, mayor uh, should be compensated for the hours that they are investing in our community. Um, uh, for many of the naysayers, uh, no, we shouldn't pay because they're not doing a good job. Uh, let's not look back because the ones that we've had in the past have not been paid. Let's look forward to what a paid council person might draw. Uh, once again, to those uh, say, no, we don't need to pay them because we have attorneys, we have retired uh, officers on, on the council. Um, uh, that, that's not a bad thing. But again, we have uh, professionals, we have uh, intellectuals, we have uh, a, a great many uh, in our community that could participate if they could pay the rent and pay the mortgage. And so I think we need to open the door to involve more people. And, and we need not base the answer to this question on past performance, because that's changing uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity to pay We'll, we'll make a shift between what we've had and the great potential we could. Once again, we're opening the doors for more community involvement with council and mayoral pay. Thank you, Mr. Slyke. Mr. Cryer. Thank you. Do I think that council members on average put in 40 to 50 hours a week plus in order to do a good job? Yes, they do. I see that on behalf of all my, client, my colleagues every week and have seen that since Colonel Gallagher and I got on city council a little over a year ago. Uh, do I think they deserve to be paid? Absolutely. But uh, I voted against putting council pay on the ballot, and I did that because I think our number one responsibility right now is to get a police and fire union contract done, one that is fair to both sides and is affordable for the, for the taxpayers. And it did not seem to me that we should be focused on pay for us at a time when we have not resolved the issue of what, are the, what is the pay and benefits for our police and fire going to be. There'll be plenty of time down the road in other elections to deal with council pay, but right now, that's the number one issue for me, and that's why I voted not to put it on the ballot this time. Thank you for explaining that. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, I am absolutely in favor of this change to the charter. I uh, was appointed by the mayor to be on the charter commission, and this was one of the items that I fought for diligently because I think it is absolutely essential to the future of San Antonio. I think there's something very wrong about having people work <coughs> 50, 60 hours a week and not uh, receive some kind of compensation for it. But it goes both ways. I also want 100% of the attention of that person who has been elected to that position because I want them doing that job and not 
not showing up to meetings or going somewhere else when they ought to be doing their elected job. So for that reason, it's something that I, I strongly support. I believe that uh, the city of San Antonio and the people that I've spoken to in many, many different forms all agree that this is something that is long overdue that we must make happen. And you know, one of the problems, and I understand the Councilman Cryer's position on this, is that we are in the middle right now of these negotiations, but there will always be some issue that causes us not to bring this forward. And so I said, I don't care what time it is, it's something we've got to get done. So I would encourage all the voters to turn out and support this change to the charter. I think we have uh, time for one more question for each of the panelists before we get into closing remarks. Would that be appropriate, Allegra? Okay, great, great. Wow. Uh, my, my, my question, I'm gonna take my moderator hat off for a second. I'm gonna put my banker hat on. Um, and, and the reason why is economic development in a community is absolutely key. It really is the engine that helps foster growth in the community. My question to you, uh, gentlemen, are, is San Antonio continues to grow at a record pace as a result of new business and job creation. Do you believe that tax incentives provided by the city should be used to attract prospective companies? I lead off again? Absolutely. I'll tell you, that was good <laughs> because I don't know if I could hit with men on base. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I guess like Coach Popovich, you know, they despise the uh, intentional filing. And, and some people want that rule changed. And, uh, and, and Pops kind of uh, uses it because it's legal. Uh, my view is if somebody's getting paid five million and they can't make a file, leave the rule the way it is and he better learn how to shoot files. And when it comes to tax incentives, I, I do not like tax incentives but every other country and every other state and every other city uses them. So I would imagine that we would have to continue using them as, as a prudent economic gener uh, generator. I think the greatest economic generator that we could have is to have a well-trained and, and well-educated uh, 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 workforce. And uh, you, you, you play by the rules as they are, and the way they are, I think we need to continue with tax incentives and we need to continue to try to attract uh, uh, excellent paying jobs to our city as, as, in any way that we reasonably can. You owe me 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Although you went over one for 15 seconds, so <laughs> deduct it. He's a bank. <laughs> I know, you can uh, never Mr. Vance, like other you, guys for court. The same question to you, sir. Uh, tax incentives work. They do work. And in some occasions, and I think it's a, a limited occasions, they fail. And so uh, the challenge we have, and I think Bert uh, uh, brought it up, if we're competing with other cities to bring uh, jobs and opportunities to San Antonio, uh, and we take that off the table, we're done. And so, so we, we've got to continue with it. And once again, uh, to help the population understand what's involved, uh, we need to inform. And when I say that, we have such a great opportunity to communicate to our, our community and, and share information and, and, and bring more participants to the table. You, you bring a company to town and, and provide them an incentive to, to give employment uh, greater than bringing outsiders in to, to make our community aware of the value and the benefit of it where, where our very residents could get uh, uh, those opportunities. And again, Bert offered up uh, from the tax incentives uh, comes some employment uh, education and, and development of the unemployed uh, where that could be stimulated through the tax incentives. So uh, they work, they work. And like anything, there are the exceptional failures. Uh, but yes, I think that uh, it's a great tool for San Antonio. Great, thank you so much for your response. Mr. Cryer, please, you, same Joe. question to you. You bet. I, five years ago, we dramatically restructured how we do economic development in this community. I had a chance to participate in that effort, and we decided for the first time 
that the city and the county would contribute money to the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation to be a full partner in those efforts. And in exchange for that, both of those governmental entities would be involved in the management of the foundation at the, at the executive committee and topmost levels. I asked for, and we are now in the process of a five-year review of what did we get for that. Uh, the city has invested substantial cash as has the county. It seemed to me that five years was an appropriate period of time to say what have been the results, was the investment worth it, should it be continued. In principle, we've got to offer these incentives. Why? Because our competitors do it. I used to go to the meetings of the 100 largest chambers in the country. To a person, they all agreed that if we could live in a world where no one offered incentives, we would do that. But if, you're, if your competitor's doing it, you've got to do it. As Marty Wender says, the reason we pay $5 million to our football coach is because that's what the other schools we're competing with do. So do we need the incentives? Yes. Do they produce results? You bet they do. I was a part of Team Toyota, and they sure produced great results there. Uh, this is a good time, though, to review what we've gotten for that, and I look forward to taking part in that review later this year. Great. Mr. Gallagher, please. Uh, I'm in full support of this, and it's really because uh, I like the analogy that, that that's the game that's being played right now. If our competitors are using tax incentives, then we need to do exactly the same thing. Otherwise, we could really be at a big loss. The one thing that hasn't come out, though, that everybody needs to realize is there are a whole set of rules that whenever that we uh, talk to these uh, uh, enterprises that we say to them, if you don't follow these rules, if you don't hire so many people, if you don't do this training, if you don't grow at this rate, you're not going to get those incentives. In fact, you're going to owe us money. And because of that, I feel very comfortable whenever we go through these and uh, you watch Cheryl Scully, she bangs her fists on the table and said, this is what they've got to do or they're not going to get this benefit that uh, we've offered them. And because that exists, because that is a written document that exists, we are protected as a city. So it's something that I think we can be proud of and I know it can work if it's done properly. Excellent. We're going to have to move on to the closing statements. So. Whatever, whatever it is that you didn't get a chance to answer, like what will be the issues that you are more worried about in your district and how to solve your closing statements, you're welcome. You, you each have two minutes. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, just before uh, we, we do that, gentlemen, I, don't want to th I want to thank you really quick for your time today. But this, this, obviously, these forums are very, very important. The job that you're in the process of running for it, I can't tell you from my perspective how important that is. And we, the taxpayer and the voters, put uh, literally our, our, our future, our lives in your hands. So we really, really appreciate the time that, that you're taking to be with us this morning. So closing statements, Mr. Cryer, you're up first, sir. Thank you. And thanks to the sponsors for this event. It's a great opportunity to talk about real issues. I've had an opportunity in the last year and a half to take part in some decisions that will affect this city for literally decades to come. The decision we made to give voters uh, the right to choose on whether or not we build streetcars. The decision on securing a 30-year supply of water, which we uh, desperately have needed for literally the last 40 or 50 years. The decision to adopt a back to basics city budget. So we've gotten a lot done in the last year and a half, but we've got a lot of big challenges in front of us. Number one is we've got to get a police and fire union agreement that gives us the best police and fire personnel this city can afford. We need good pay and good benefits, a deal that's fair to both sides, but most of all is fair to the taxpayers. Secondly, we've got to make sure that the Vista Verde pipeline project is done on time and on budget, and council has got to stay on top of that issue. We're going to be looking at another back to basics budget this fall. Uh, again, maintaining streets and drainage, police and fire, parks and libraries without a property tax increase. We're going to be selecting a new police chief, working with the city manager and a new city attorney. That's important. And finally, we will be laying the groundwork for the 2017 bond issue. And we're going to, be need, we're going to need to start a thoughtful process that brings community leaders together, representatives of neighborhoods and the business community, and say to each other, what kind of 
streets projects do we need in the next bond campaign? What kind of drainage projects? What kind of library and park improvements do we need? That's a big ticket item and it's decisions that will impact the city for literally decades to come. I look forward to being a part of those decisions and a part of that council overview uh, if the voters are kind enough to reelect me and I ask for their vote. Next, Mr. Van Slyke, please. Thanks, sir. Um, we do have big decisions in the future and how we go about doing them. And I think every time any, any person says we or they, we need to back up and say, who are we? Who are they? Um, we should be everybody in San Antonio. We need to reach out. Uh, uh, there, there's an ambivalent situation here. There's an overwhelming apathy. Uh, and, and you talk to the people, and, and without a doubt, they're frustrated with the political process, the, the perception of what's going on downtown. And so they just throw their hands up and say, I don't, I, I don't want to support anybody. And so we need to get them back into the fold. They have so much to contribute. Um, we found energy down in South Texas, and so we go down and start fracking, and, and what amazing that's done for our economy and for, for uh, South Texas and San Antonio. We have that same energy in the population in San Antonio that has not yet been tapped. If we can tap that energy, our economic uh, status will, will, it'll be a boom also. We have got to do that. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, the issue of the streetcar vote. That is, it's sad. That's a short voting, uh, short-sighted vote uh, uh, for what was an ill-conceived idea by, by a few. Uh, and the same few that did design the streetcar issue have designed the toll roads. And so we need to expand that uh, or, or address that. The last thing I'd like to address, because I think that your questions have pretty much gone the gambit. Uh, Joe talks about hiring our next police chief. We need, we have got our qualified personnel here in San Antonio. We're the seventh largest city in, in the nation. We have officers, uh, <coughs> command officers that understand the city, the community. Uh, the challenges going elsewhere could happen here. I think that we need to hire within. Promoter. Thank you very much for your response. Mr. Ciccone, the floor is yours, sir. I feel much more comfortable batting third, like <laughs> Clemente and Mutual and so on and so forth. And uh, my, you've heard of the KISS principle. Well, my principle is the KISS principle squared. And that is keep it simple and keep it short. And I am going to touch on the most important issue that will affect all of our decisions well into the future. And that isn't a police contract, it isn't a road, it isn't a toll road, and it isn't a baseball team or a soccer team. Soccer. What it is are the people that sit on city council and make, they become informed and they make the decisions. And we have to show respect for those people and give them reasonable compensation to work for us the best way they possibly can. And if we don't like what they're doing, it's a democracy. Vote them out. That is the most important issue and the amount of money you can't put everything on, on hold because there's a contract that we're dealing with. It may take 10 years to solve that contract. And the amount of money we're talking about to compensate all of these excellent people that, that are on our council is less than the city manager makes. And she's worth every penny she, make, she earns. Don't misunderstand me. But it's a pittance in, in, a, in, a, city contra, in, a, in a city budget. Right, Mr. Banker? Absolutely, I can you know, okay. that. It, 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 is, it is very, very little. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I've been with these men and women, I've been in enough elections and I've lost a few of them, but that's, that's beside the point. We really don't deserve the men and women that have got in, in the arena, and there are three of them right here with me. And I'd say three out of four isn't bad. And, uh, and we need more competition we need to show respect for the office and the people that hold it. Our elected officials deserve our support. Pay them. Great. Thank you for your, uh, your response, Mr. Ciccone. Okay, Mr. Gallagher, you're, you're last up. Clean but you're up. batting cleanup. Yeah, I'm batting cleanup. <clears throat> so 
to use an analogy. We'll yeah, okay. Well, without question, uh, number one, thank you so much for having us here today. I think uh, you hit on all the big issues. You really did. Those were great questions. Those are the things that are on the front burner for all of us, and we do care about them very much. Uh, one thing that I think that uh, we need to be careful about, though, is city focus. Where, where is the attention? to the issues that are facing us. I've seen this in my own district. In District 10, we have what we call the Northeast Corridor that we're working on. And what that is, it's an area that back in the 1960s, 1970s was growing, it looked great, but over the years, it's just like the people there, they've gotten old and it's slowly deteriorated. Well, this wasn't a part of any downtown project. This was out uh, in the suburbs at the time. But now what we really have, because we're such a big city, is a whole lot of downtowns. They're all over the city. And what we need to do as a city is start focusing on all of these areas and not just selfishly look at one because there's a bunch of areas need all kind of investment and cleanup. And I would just hope that the city as a whole will take that into consideration. And the last thing I wanna say is that I'm very concerned about voter apathy. I think it's extremely important that voters do get out this time around and make sure that they do express their vote. Talk about this idea of the charter changes that are going to occur. Talk about those propositions that are going to affect our water supply in the future. And then, of course, we've got this huge uh, candidate list for mayor that people have got to sort through, and then, of course, the council candidates. So I hope people will turn out in this election and let their voices be heard. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. It is important for our community to hear from you. So thank you so much. And let's talk yes. about an app now. Technology. Thank you, Arlena. Yes, and thank you, candidates, for coming. I know it was early in the morning. We really appreciate, uh, on behalf of the chamber, your honest answers and opinions. And thank you for coming and taking the time. And our moderators and our sponsors, UTSA has been so gracious to let us use this space. Tammy is here. Thank you. And especially Telemundo, our go-to media source, has been really great. Thank you for your district-specific questions and for covering. And Nowcast has been here through every step of the way and they've been really great with us too.